climate change. The climate's always changing. Saying that the climate's changing is like saying women have babies. Tell me something I don't know. But of course the public have no idea how much the climate changes, how dramatically and quickly the climate changes, and I'll show you that very briefly. So for example, in my short lifetime, from 1900 to 1940 the global temperature was going up. And then from 1940 to 1980 it went down. And from 1980 to 1998 it went up. And from 1998 to now it's going down. That's in my short lifetime, four climate changes. I survived them all. <laughs> and the lack of CO2 has nothing to do with my lack of hair. <laughs> By the way, I, I like to tell people, you're looking at someone that would love to have a bad hair day. <laughs> okay, I, I shouldn't get too flippant about this, but I'd love to have bring some humor into it because if I could name the human species, by the way, you know what I'd call us? Homo humorous rumorous, right? Because we need a sense of humor and we love gossip, right? Doesn't that sum up the human person right there? Uh, but here, this shows you that same ice core record from Antarctica. Here's the current temperature and the temperature goes down to the ice age in here and then up. So these peaks are what we call interglacials. You should be darn grateful we live in an interglacial. <laughs> Canada is certainly grateful. It wouldn't have existed 20,000 years ago. All right. And so when you look at this, and then again remember what they're telling you. Oh, it's, war it's warmer than it's ever been. But look at the previous interglacials, how warm they were. <coughs> And you go back to 120,000 years. Barney Rubble wasn't driving a car. Okay? It's got nothing to do with CO2. But what I want you to notice is look at how quickly the temperature rose, but how quickly it also drops. Look at the variability. That's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit or more of variability of temperature in each of those ups and downs. That's normal. But you've been led to believe that change is not normal, that what's going on is not normal. You'll have a hard time figuring out what you're looking at here uh, because it's a view of the world that you very rarely see. What you're doing here is you've got the North Pole in the center. You're looking down on the North Pole. It's complicated by the fact that here, this is 18,000 years ago, here's the massive Laurentide ice sheet covering most of Canada and northern US, the Greenland ice sheet, the Eurasian ice sheet, that's just 18,000 years ago. Just 18,000 years ago. And, 18, 000, and here, here's the North American picture, right? And in fact, uh, we, we had a, an ardent Canadian uh, nationalist, because what happened is as this glacier advanced, it scraped all the soil off of Canada and deposited it across the northern states. <laughs> and, and he argued that we should have got that back as part of the NAFTA agreement. <laughs> that, that, was, that was our soil that you could. But, but you, can, you can see, now, where did the water come from for all that ice? The answer is it came from out of the oceans. So 18,000 years ago, the oceans were 420 feet lower than they are today. Right? You wouldn't need a Washington ferry. You wouldn't, wouldn't need BC ferries. Right? You'd all interconnect it. And um, you can see how much the... Um, this, this is uh, 18,000 years ago, and you see the sea level, and look at the rapid rise in sea level in a period of about 6,000 years. Oh, they're telling Al Gore, oh, the, the sea level's going to rise, it's going to be the end of the world. Panicking you with that. And then, so you see from, uh, from here about 15,000 years ago up uh, to 8,000 years ago, that's when the dramatic increase in sea level, so 427 feet uh, approximately. For the last 8,000 years, sea level has increased very, very slightly. And this is another problem. You see, they tell you, oh, you hear another story about Antarctica, and oh, it's going to melt and crash into the ocean, the sea level is going to rise. Hang on a minute. Remember the old grade 8 experiment when you put a glass of water and you put an ice cube in it? And it was, what will happen when the ice cube melts? Most people think the water will spill out over the edge of the glass. And it 
not right. Some will say, well, the, the water level will stay the same. They're not right either. In fact, the water level will go down, right? Because when water freezes into ice, it expands. The ice occupies more space than the water that formed it. So if the Antarctic and Greenland ice caps were to melt, most of them are already under, under below sea level. So that, in fact, wouldn't affect sea level. In fact, it would cause a decline in sea level. But they don't tell you that. Right? So, and then, if you're standing on the shore, like you're down in the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana coastline there, you say, oh, there, oh the sea level's uh, coming in. It's, it's advancing in. Do you know what's happening there? The land is sinking. The land is sinking. Because you can stand on a shoreline, and if the sea level line is moving, you don't know if it's because the water's rising or falling or because the land's rising or falling. And I can show you places all around the world. Hudson Bay in Canada is getting smaller at a very rapid rate. A place called Sloops Cove, where the Hudson Bay Company used to tie up their, their sailing ships, is now above water even at high tide. And that's in just 200 years. That's geologic change. That's tremendous. So change, very dramatic, going on all of the time. This, this gives you an illustration about the sea level. This, this is a, a graph of about 10,000 years. And you notice what I'm doing is taking very long records, and then we're looking at shorter and shorter time periods. This is from Greenland. This is ice core data, the temperature from Greenland over the last 10,000 years. Here's the current temperature over here. It's been warmer than the current temperature for most of the last 10,000 years. But again, they don't tell you that. It is that warming that caused the ice to melt. It's called the Holocene Optimum. Optimum, warmer temperatures. Okay. So when, when you look at that, and I've got an arrow here, and I'll, I'll tie that in for you here. This is a photograph that I got from Professor Ritchie from the University of Toronto. Um, he's passed away now. But what it shows here, this is a white spruce, Picea glauca, and it's radiocarbon dated at around 4,940 years old. And yet it's 100 kilometers north of the current tree line. To have a tree grow to that dimension in that latitude, the temperature has to be 2 to 3 degrees warmer than currently. All right? And they're saying, oh, 2 to 3 degrees warmer is going to be the end of the world. How did the polar bear survive this? How did the polar bear survive this? Well, we'll look at that question because, of course, that's one of the things that they want to play on people's emotions with. Extinction. Oh, then we've got to find, a, a, like, the world wildlife. Oh, we've got to have the panda. It's got to be nice, fuzzy fur ball with nice big round. I tell you, I've seen those polar bears. <laughs> they, they are hunting machines, killer machines. Okay. <laughs> But let me, let me tell you that animals, by the way, animals are not going extinct. This is the, one of the great myths. In fact, it's estimated we've only found, located, and identified 35% of all the plants and animals on the planet. Only 35%. They found an animal the size of a small cow in the Vietnam forest about four years ago, and they had a war there. <laughs> How did the cow escape the war? No, I mean, hmm. <laughs> But think about the extinction thing. Let me tell you, there are a lot of animals that are doing very well, thank you very much. Pigeons, seagulls, coyotes, snakes. Have I mentioned any you like yet? <laughs> oh, you see, it's a very emotional thing. You know, we've got to have those nice white. And, and by the way, let me give you an idea of how distorted this can get. One of the things we did in the East Coast when I was anti-submarine was we had to watch and monitor the seal hunt. Okay, and they brought Brigitte Bardot over and said, all oh, these horrible people are killing the young seals. It was their livelihood. And it was a horrible life, very, very harsh life. And, and uh, they, they set up Brigitte Bardot, by the way. They said, oh, if you're going, the Newfoundlanders said, and they're wonderful people, they said, if you're going out in the ice, you've got to wear the right clothing. Here's some good boots and some good pants to wear. And then when she came back, they told her they were seal skin boots. And <laughs> she just went berserk. But, the, the other thing is, of course, as you know, Greenpeace decided they were going to defend uh, the seals. And uh, so they, of course, the name Greenpeace. The Newfoundlanders, with their wonderful sense of humor, 
They said, we are going to protect the cod, because the seals are killing the cod. So they formed a group called Cod Peace. <laughs> but, but here you can see, as I said, you can see what, how warm it was when that spruce tree uh, was formed. And this is looking at, at the, the last thousand years of, of European temperatures. Here's the current temperature. And going back, you can see to the Little Ice Age, around 1680, the nadir of temperatures then. And when you look here at Dickens Winter, what do you think of when you think of Charles Dickens? Do you think of, of Christmas Carol, snowy winters, harsh conditions, workhouses? The first nine years of Dickens' life in London, it snowed every single winter and the snow stayed on the ground for three months. You don't even get a vestige of that today. Nobody's arguing that warming hasn't occurred. The question is, how long has the warming been going on? Well, the most recent warming, as I said, is from the Little Ice Age. You don't understand the fur trade unless you understand how cold it was in the 17th century in Europe. I gave a talk to a group, when, and it was a French historian of fur, uh, French clothing. You think you had a boring job. Right? And he came up after and he said, you know, I was reading about French aristocrats wearing fur underwear. Right? And he said, I couldn't make any sense out of it. And he said, now when I find out how cold it was, I said, hang on a minute, these are French aristocrats. Maybe it wasn't the cold. <laughs> <laughs> but if I, tell you that it, if I tell you that in 1704 they had ice on the Mediterranean in the south of France, you start to understand how cold it was. Okay? And, and uh, so then you've got this medieval optimum, this very warm period around a thousand years ago. Um, that had significant effect in North America here. For example, the drought all through the Four Corners and that whole Southwest, the Anasazi people, the impact of that drought. And by the way, they migrated. This is another thing that you need to understand. People react and respond and migrate. Absolutely amazing how much people migrate. In fact, there are Navajo and Hopi words in the language of the Dene people in the High Arctic, even today. Of course, that's been transmitted by those people migrating. Uh, also, by the way, because of the tobacco trade. They took tobacco up there. But, of course, during this warm period in Europe, and they consider 12th century the optimum century in Scottish history. Why? Because it was warm and they could grow crops. Because this is one thing we must never forget. Remember I talked about getting rid of the leaders that with the food supply failed. Surplus food is surplus time, and with that surplus time you can create any kind of economy you want. And all of the people throughout history, and the, the founding fathers, Jefferson talked about how important agriculture was as the fundamental part of your economy. If you can't feed yourself, you're at the mercy of everybody. And, and so, of course, they, they were able to grow lots of food, and that left lots of time when they could build Gothic cathedrals. They had the manpower, the people that were available to do it, because somebody was producing enough food for, for themselves and for other people. And by the way, one of the great, you talk about American exceptionalism, no nation in the history of the world has ever produced as much food as the United States where now you've got 2% of your population producing enough food to fill, feed your own people and to export. But of course what that means is that a lot of people then are in the cities and don't understand the food supply and all the problems that engender with that. But no, no nation has ever achieved what the US did in terms of food production. Uh, when, when you look at um, the other side, here we go. Uh, during the Little Ice Age, this is a painting of the Thames of London. In 1683, there was three feet of ice on the Thames in London, England. You can't even imagine that today. And again, as I said, think about the fur trade, the demand for furs and what this meant. And you can see here, here they're working. This is the old London Bridge before it fell down. And, and so you can see the implications of that. Um, there's lots, uh, I, I do a whole uh, show of, of climate and art relating how the climate depicts the art through time. This is the most recent temperature of the world. It's a composition of, of four different temperature rec records. 
NASA, and, and so on, and the satellites from the University of Huntsville at Alabama. And what it shows is from 1979, the temperature is going up. And then, of course, since 1998, uh, it's changed. And, of course, when it was going up, they called that global warming. And then from 1998 onwards, they had a problem. Because Mother Nature wasn't going along with what they were forecasting. And so, instead of going back and saying, our science is wrong, they moved the goalposts. And they called it climate change. Okay? And if you want proof that that was deliberately done, here, and I hope you can see this all right, here's a quote from some emails that were deliberately leaked on these corrupt scientists. And it says, uh, the CRU, the Climatic Research Unit, the IPCC, in an email from the Tyndall Center on the UAA campus said, in my experience, global warming freezing is already a bit of a public relations problem with the media. Right? People were starting to make jokes about, oh, you know, <laughs> where's that global warming? Right? I, I like to tell people it's another undelivered government promise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, and then this Swedish alarmist, Bo Yellen, he said, I agree with Nick that climate change might be a better labeling than global warming. They deliberately change the labeling. And so you start to see what's going on. That their global warming scare, the evidence, this by the way, their hypothesis was CO2 goes up, the temperature will go up. But if CO2 was continuing to go up, the temperature wasn't going up anymore. This is what Huxley said 100 years ago is a, the great bane of, of, of science, a wonderful hypothesis destroyed by an ugly fact. <laughs> right? And so you, you had this difficulty. And here's the graph. Taking that from 1998 on, you can see the temperature sli declining slightly. Look what the CO2 is going. It's not supposed to happen. Not supposed to happen, but that's what's going on.